organizations. We got to, we have some um, very talented and committed folks that uh, put the time in, and uh, what a blessing it is. Just mention um, this. Um, of course, Rivo returning from Papua New Guinea. Keep him in your prayers. Probably the the main thing is done now, but uh, still, when he needs safety and return. Uh, but as well, um, m most of you are familiar with uh, Good Shepherd uh, Church in Albany Creek. There, uh, Pastor Lloyd's mother uh, passed away just this this Friday. So she's been ill for some time, and um, you know, being in prayer for him and his family, it's it's always a, a hard time. We're we're looking tonight at. Um, Keys to spiritual growth. We, we started this last week, and kind of the, the theme verse of 2 Peter 3.18, where God says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. That's a, a good verse. That would be a good verse to memorize, 2 Peter 3.18. God wants us to be growing spiritually. You know, I don't think there's any end to that this side of heaven. I don't think you'll ever reach a place where, oh, that's it, I'm, I'm just like Jesus. <laughs> if you are, you're going you, to have to repent of your, your pride, I guess. But uh, God wants us to keep growing. And God is so gracious. You know, he doesn't pile it all onto us the first day we get saved. But he does, he does keep after us. <laughs> you know, you, you learn one thing, and then he says, okay, now here's the next thing. Oh, <laughs> thought, I, thought I knew everything. No. God will, will help you and, and encourage you. We saw last week the source of spiritual growth is the Bible. You, you will not grow without getting into God's Word. 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. There is no substitute. All right? There's no seminar you can go to. There's no DVDs you can buy. Uh, you know, there, there's no magic formula. You've got to get into God's Word to grow spiritually. And the purpose is the glory of God. The purpose is not just to have a better life. The purpose is for the glory of God. Now, God will give you a better life, but uh, that's not the purpose. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Yeah, you know, we say that and we know that, but uh, we don't always live that. I want to finish that theme. We, we started looking last week at how to glorify God. Uh, there's so many, we, w we won't cover them all. But if we're going to go grow spiritually, uh, we said last week we need to aim at glorifying God. That needs to be our, our purpose. The verse I just quoted, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, that needs to be our aim. Whatever we're doing, we need to do it for the glory of God. And it, it starts with salvation. Now, God will get his glory. But for us to be a, an active part of it, uh, I'm not quite sure, sure even how to phrase this, but uh, for it to benefit us, let me put it that way, uh, we need to be saved. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, God will get his glory, but we want to have a good part of it. We don't want to give God glory by going to hell. Uh, we want to give God glory by being part of his, his perfect plan. And let me ask you, has it started in your life? Uh, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Uh, that's that's the, the beginning, is salvation. Well, then, let's go on. Uh, turn to Joshua chapter 7, verse 19. Now, a lot of these verses, I'll, I'll give you a, a slip of paper when we're done here that will have a, many of these listed for you. But Joshua chapter 7, verse 19. Chapter 7 is the account when Israel had been defeated at Ai. Many of you will know the story. And uh, God told them, you know, Joshua's upset. You know, Why are we defeated? God said there's sin in the camp. And they went through and they found out it was a man named Achan. He had sinned. He'd done just exactly the opposite of what God had told him to do. And in Joshua 7, verse 19, Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Do you realize that confession gives glory to God? And confession is just agreeing with God. Joshua is saying to Achan there, 
you need to agree with God. You need to just admit that what you did was wrong. You know, sometimes it's so hard to say, that it's almost the world's hardest words, aren't they? I was wrong. <laughs> and that's what we need to do in our relationship with God. And that gives glory to God. I've been around long enough. I've, I've seen people blame God for their sin. Excuses, excusing sin blames God. We can come up with all kinds of excuses. Started with Adam and Eve, didn't it? You remember them? They, well, didn't know them personally, I'm sure, but uh, you remember the story. Adam said, the woman you gave me. <laughs> and men been blaming their wives ever since. You know? <laughs> and then uh, Eve said, oh, that, that serpent. It's the first century equivalent of the devil made me do it. You know, uh, We blame others, but that doesn't bring glory to God. We need to agree with God. When God asked Adam and Eve, you know, where, where are you? It wasn't that he didn't know. <laughs> he wanted them to say what was wrong. He wanted them to agree with him. Uh, I've seen it. I remember we had a man that when I was pastoring in Rockingham. Uh, his, his excuse was he'd ask God to take away his smoking and God hadn't done it. So it was God's fault. Uh, we had, uh, I knew another man who, whose kids hadn't really turned out the way he had hoped. And he, he said, well, you know, God promised raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And I did that. So it must be God's fault that my kids have turned out wrong. He, he couldn't quite see that he might. He, everyone else could see that he hadn't really raised him right. But anyway, uh, not confessing is to blame God. We need to live for the glory of God. There's going to be plenty of times in our life when we're going to be wrong. And we need to just agree with God. There's no glory when we blame God. There's no glory when we won't confess our sin. If you look in 1 John chapter 1, you know, we probably most of us know 1 John 1, 9. Verses 8 and 10 on either side of it there make some important statements about this, this subject. 1 John 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Wow, those are some strong statements, aren't they? Uh, confession glorifies God. Our sin is not God's fault. You know, it, it's so easy in life to blame the situation. Oh, I was, I was feeling tired. That's, that's why I lashed out. I was hungry. I, was, I mean, we can come up with a thousand excuses, can't we? We can't just... If we're going to glorify God, we need to just say, listen, what I did, what I said, what I was, was wrong. And we need to quit excusing it. We need to bring glory to God in that way. Confession is basically agreeing with God. Uh, the fourth thing is, is faith. In, um, if you're there in 1 John, 1 John 5, verse 10, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. I was thinking about this, this verse and this idea this week. You know, a lot of times people, um, when you ask them about their salvation or about going to heaven, the comment is, yeah, I've been pretty good. I think I'll go to heaven. And I, I, I think the next time somebody says that to me, I'm going to say, well, do you realize you're calling God a liar when you say that? <laughs> uh, we need to understand it takes faith. We need to believe what God has said. I don't know if you've ever had somebody not believe you when, when you were telling the truth. <laughs> that, that one time you were telling, no. Yeah. It, it's a really hard thing uh, on your character. It's just, it just hits you right in the heart when... You're, you're telling somebody the truth and they accuse you of lying to them. Man, that's hard. Can you imagine saying that to God? Faith is believing God. Uh, not believing God is to, to call Him a liar. There's no glory there. Uh, we read another time, Romans 4 and verse 20, where it talks about uh, Abraham. This is more positive. Uh, Romans 4.20 says, Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. If you know Abraham's story, you know, God called him to go to a place that he didn't even tell him where he was going. He just said, Abraham, you're going to head off. I'll tell you when you get there. 
And Abraham just believed God. He just went. Now, he had a definite word. It wasn't, a, you know, some in, indefinite thing. But Abraham was, was willing to believe God. Believing God honors him. Now, let me, let me put a couple of questions to you here. You don't have to answer me out loud or anything, but do you believe that God keeps his word? I think most Christians would say, yeah, I believe God keeps his word. Let me ask you this. Do you live like you believe God keeps his word? Man, there's a big difference there sometimes, isn't there? You know, we'll, we, uh, you know, we love to talk about things of faith, and yet many times we, we don't live the things of faith. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, he says, Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. We need to live our faith. Uh, there's a verse you need to know, James 1.22, where he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. And then he adds, deceiving your own selves. I, I think there's just something built into us where we think because we've read something, we've done it. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen where you, you can't remember if you've done something? Uh, you know you thought about it, but did you actually do it? You know? And in the Christian life, it's not enough to know what God says. We've got to do it. We need to be people of, of faith. The people, a couple of men that came to mind were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, not many people name their kids after these guys anymore, but uh, they, were, they were great men of faith. We, we, uh, we knew a, a man whose name was Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. And uh, he, he said his mother didn't name him Abednego because he was a an American black man. He said, people might say a bad Negro. <laughs> um, so there, there's one that named him after him. But in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17, uh, this is when these men uh, would not bow down to the uh, idol. Remember, you remember the situation? It's a true story. They would not bow down to the idol. Well, of course, they stood up like sore thumbs. You know, everybody else has fallen down. Here they are. Made the king furious. And he's going to throw them in the fiery furnace. Now, it's one thing to say, I will not bow down to idols. I am going to live for God. But now, push comes to shove, whatever that means. And, uh, you know, they've got to take a stand. In Daniel chapter 3, verse, well, actually verse 16, the end of the verse, he says, hey, I love this, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. They're talking to the king. He's, his nostrils are flared, smoke's coming out his ears, and, man, he is, he's really had it with them. It's basically, they're saying, we don't even have to think about our answer. Now, they're not being uh, smart aleck or anything. They're just saying, this is something we've decided long ago. And here's their answer. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. <laughs> their attitude was, listen, if God wants to, he can save us from the fire. He will deliver us from you. It might be by fire. <laughs> Uh, they just had, had taken a stand. They were willing to live by faith. You know, we love to quote Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, we love to quote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. <laughs> but then, you know, the trouble comes and a lot of times we fall in a heap instead of living by faith. Uh, God is glorified when we believe him. I came across... a. Uh, a modern day example of this, a family named uh, Willis, uh, Mr. Past, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Willis, uh, and this is written by uh, one of their children, I believe when he was an adult. He, he said, my sister and five brothers had died just one week before. A piece of metal had broken off the back of a semi-trailer truck, puncturing the gas tank of my parents' minivan. The vehicle exploded into flames, immediately burning to death four of my brothers and my youngest sister. My parents and brother Ben managed to get out and were rushed to the hospital. Ben didn't make it through the first night. So out of seven children, six, six of their children were, were killed, just like that. Uh, they, they, were having a pre, they were having a press conference uh, just a few weeks, um, one, one week after. Before the cameras, my father, a grade school teacher, Thank those who had generously helped our family in our time of need. He was glad to have the opportunity to show his gratitude publicly. My dad opened the press conference by quoting a psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 
Even in the midst of physical and emotional pain, he knew that he was to trust that God is good. You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'll trust the Lord. But sometimes it's going to be put to the test. God's good all the time. And we don't know that by our situation. We live in a, a sin-cursed world. And uh, we, uh, we harvest uh, the results of, of the sin all around us. He mentioned it's hard enough to publicly praise God in times of pain and suffering, but is anyone able to reasonably explain the why? We, we just won't know the why many times uh, until eternity. Um, God is glorified when we believe Him. God is glorified when we come to Him for salvation. When we confess our sin, we, we agree with Him. When we believe Him. Uh, another area, John chapter 15 and verse 8, God is glorified by fruitfulness. John chapter 15, verse 8. Now, if I remember that incident correctly, I think that son that lived was not actually in the car with them, but I could be wrong on that. They had seven children. Six of them were killed uh, almost immediately. John chapter 15 and verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. God is glorified as we, well, in a sense we could say as we grow spiritually. As we have a product to our life. You know, good things that God is able to do. Uh, people need to see God in us. You know, there's most people, the, the only testimony they may have could be you or me. And uh, we need to be people who are bearing fruit. There's different ways that people explain that idea, but uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says, You are a chosen generation, a ro royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we're God's people. We're there to show people something about the Lord. Uh, later in uh, 1 Peter 2, 12, he says, Having your conversation, that, that's your manner of life, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And there needs to be something about us as we live for the Lord, as we, as we live our lives, that others can see Jesus in us, that we can bear fruit, seeing people come to Him, that we can bear fruit and that our character becomes more and more like Jesus, that we can bear fruit in the fruit of the Spirit, you know, uh, just seeing God doing a work in a spiritual growth is a wonderful thing. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants us to, to bear fruit. Let me ask you, what are you doing for the Lord? You know, we, we love having Him be our Heavenly Father and being able to go to Him in times of trouble. But what are you doing for Him? I know many of you are very busy and, and, and have things that you're doing for the Lord, and I, I'm uh, a beneficiary of that for, for many of you. Um, but you know, each one of us needs to stop and think, what am I doing with my time? Am, am, am I bearing fruit? Is it going to be profitable? Is it going to bring glory to, to God? Is your life aimed at the glory of God? Let me um, maybe get some, let's see, what did I do with them? Here they are here. Maybe, Neville, if you could hand those, those out. This is a piece of paper, and the title is How to Glorify God, and, and many of the things that I've mentioned tonight, will, uh, the topics will, will be on there. And uh, I'd encourage you to put this in your Bible. Uh, I've given you the instructions there. We've looked at, at several things already, uh, how to glorify God. We need, we need to be saved to glorify God. We need to aim at the glory of God in, in everything. Uh, we need to confess our sin, agree with God. We need to believe God. Uh, we need to bear fruit. Uh, there's, there's other ways. Let me just read some of these. John 14, verse 13. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Do you realize that prayer glorifies God? As we pray in faith believing, you know, we're just saying, Lord, help me. You know, we're, the, the, the word pray means to ask. Uh, praise glorifies God. Psalm 50, verse 23. So 
Psalm 50, verse 23 says, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. You know, praise the Lord is, is not enough. You know, it's not enough just to say praise the Lord. We, we can say that, but we need to praise him. Praise him for what he's done, for who he is, for, uh, you know, for what he's said, and so on. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I think we used that verse this, this morning as well. And the context of verses 19 and 20 is moral purity. Uh, purity glorifies God. He, he's talking to them as, uh, as Christians in a wicked world. You know, we live in a wicked world, and they did too. Now, there was a lot of immorality in their society. And he says in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 6, flee fornication. If you have a TV, if you have a radio, you know we live in an adulterous, wicked world. And it's getting worse. It was very similar to the Corinthians. The, the word Corinthian became a phrase meaning you were a wicked person. You know, you're, they're like, a, they're a Corinthian, you know. Uh, and he's telling the Christians there, flee fornication. Don't give in to the culture around you. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body or outside the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Purity. Uh, glorifies the Lord. What a blessing. Romans chapter 15, verse 5, uh, he says that unity glorifies God. Romans chapter 15, verse, verse 5, he says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see what he's saying to them? We need to be like-minded. Uh, we need to uh, live according to Christ Jesus and that with one mind and one mouth we can glorify God. Our unity, uh, verse 7, Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Listen, if there's disunity, don't let it come from you. You can't stop other people from shunning you or disdaining you or rebuking you un, uh, in an ungodly way. But it doesn't have to come from you, and you don't have to respond in like manner. Uh, God is glorified by our unity. And then uh, my least favorite, 1 first, first Peter chapter 4, uh, God is glorified by our suffering. Now, I say that uh, jokingly, but uh, I guess probably it would be true. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. It could come in our generation that we would suffer physically uh, just for normal Christian beliefs. Uh, verse 19, he says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Uh, God is faithful. And uh, whether we suffer, what, uh, whatever happens in our lives, uh, our goal needs to be to bring glory to God. Uh, when we live to glorify God, spiritual growth will occur. Uh, I can just guarantee it. If, if you'll live for the glory of God, you'll be growing spiritually. Uh, one of the verses that, that we've used several times and will continue to use in this series is 2 Corinthians 3.18. When he says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. And what's the last phrase? Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And as we look to Jesus, and, and the way we do that mainly is through His Word. And as we, by faith, apply the circumstances of life, uh, apply His Word to the circumstances of life. Uh, God says that if, if we'll live for the glory of God, uh, we will grow. We will grow spiritually. And the other thing that will happen is God will be able to give us joy. In, in our life, I think most of us want that. I don't think most of us wake up thinking, boy, I hope I'm miserable today. Uh, most of us want joy in our life. In uh, John 15, verse 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. 
Now remember the people he was speaking this to. Most of his disciples died for their faith in Christ. And yet he said, these are, you're going to have joy. You're going to have my joy. And we can have the same. Probably, I, I hope, most of us probably won't face death for Christ. But I can guarantee you, every one of us will face life. I mean, life is just so constant. And it can be tough. We're going to face life. We might face death. God says we, we need to do it for his glory. And he'll help us. He'll give us joy. He'll see us through. He's a faithful creator. To do that, you need to start right. It starts with salvation. Trusting Christ. We need to aim at God's glory. And he says just in everything, do all to the glory of God. We need to agree with God. When, when sin comes up, it's not God that has the problem. It's us. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We need to believe God. We need to serve God. And I thought maybe tonight we'd just take a, a few moments and just spend some time in, uh, in silent prayer and uh, just as an individual, just going before the Lord. And uh, whatever the Lord has, has brought to your mind tonight, um, glorifying the Lord maybe by confession or praise or purpose or, or faith or uh, whatever it might be that, that God brings to your mind. So let's just spend some time in prayer and, and then I'll, I'll close in prayer.